The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and I would like to tell the faculty and fellow seminarians what an honor it is to come back to this seminary that I love and preach now as a minister, not as a seminarian anymore. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry as we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by manifestation, the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray again. Father God, we praise your name for this seminary because here we are instructed in how to preach according to scripture and not according to culture or the times. We are aware we need to be concerned of the circumstances around us. But I pray, Lord, that you may always motivate us to keep being faithful to what Paul is here teaching us one more time, to preach Jesus Christ, his gospel, and know that your Holy Spirit is powerful to bring light into darkness and keep on saving to the uttermost. If there's anyone here this day that has not yet known Christ as Savior, let this be the time that they repent as they hear the gospel one more time. O oh Lord, speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you a good salesman? I'm thankful that I don't need to be a, a salesman, and my family is very thankful because they would starve if God called me to do that kind of work. But even though I'm not a good salesman, I know some principles for sales or being successful in sales, obvious ones. First one is you need to have a good product. That's almost a given. And the second one, in spite of the product being good, you need to know how to advertise it. You need, you need to know how to announce it to the world. Uh, important products nowadays still work a lot on uh, advertisement. And I've also heard from friends about their conferences that they go for motivation. You must understand that a salesman's life is not easy. So they need to go to these conferences and be motivated. And there they hear things like, every good salesman is aware that for every 10 rejections you receive, you have a yes. So keep on persevering. Do not lose heart. You will succeed. You will sell your product. What about the gospel? Is it a good product? It's a very good one. It is a perfect one. But the question is, how are we advertising the gospel to the world? How are we announcing it to the world? This is what Paul 
is teaching here one more time to us, especially those here that are called for the ministry. And I know there are some here today that are only hearers of the word. And I hope we have some application for you today as well. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it obviously comes after uh, chapter 3, which talks about the glory of new covenant ministry. Paul is here talking about Moses, the great Moses, the great prophet Moses. And in contrast, he's saying that now, the ministry of the new covenant is greater. And the logic is clear. Ministers of the new covenant are greater than Moses. Isn't that amazing? I could say incredible, but I know Dr. McGoldrick does not like that vocab <laughs> vocabulary. Doesn't that scare you that you are called to a ministry that is greater than that of the Old Testament. So my objective here, of course, from the text is to show you the following. We do not lose heart in ministry because the light of the gospel is enough. We do, no, do not lose heart in ministry because the light of the gospel is sufficient. And we see that in verses 1 and 2 first by the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. Let us read verses 1 and 2 again. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul clearly says here there is a calling for this ministry, this greater ministry in the new covenant. And if you are in seminary, in theory, you have been called. But Paul says, do not lose heart. And I remember being where you are some 10, 12 years ago. And so many preachers came and also our professors in the classroom. And they would remind us, the ministry is not easy. You've heard this before. And you probably have had the same reaction I had at the time. No, it's not. I will show them it's not. These are just old people in the ministry for so long, but now we are the new guns. We will show them that the ministry is not that hard. Well, after 10 years, almost 10 years in the ministry, I'm the old guy telling you that you will be tempted to lose heart. Thank you, professors. Thank you for the preachers that came here and warned us and put us in our right place. And it is very wise for you to understand that. It's not only to scare you, to alarm you, but it's the truth. The ministry is not easy. And that is why Paul is here motivating us to keep persevering in New Testament, New Covenant ministry. As he says, we do not lose heart. And he said, as we have received mercy. So when you are tempted to lose heart, that's the first thing you remember. You have received mercy. Before being called for the ministry, you received mercy from the Lord. You are saved by grace alone. That is motivation. We do not lose heart because besides being saved by grace, you received mercy, so much mercy, as you are called to the ministry. Look at yourselves. How much mercy does it take for you, not only to be a Christian, but to be called for the ministry? God is indeed good and gracious because you are here being ready 
to be a minister. We do not lose heart, but those who are losing heart, they are tempted then to change some things in ministry, especially in preaching, in order to gain more people. That's something that will make us lose heart or be tempted to. We preach and preach and preach, and Reformed churches keep being small and small and small. And then we even do street preaching, and nothing happens. Only to the Pentecostal preachers. And then you try to read books that are not so old as the Puritans, but they talk about preaching in the 21st century, and you see that that is not quite what you learn in Greenville Seminary, but it works. You look at Presbyterian churches, not only other denominations, they're doing that, are changing preaching in so many ways, and it works. They grow. People are coming. Those ministers do not seem to be losing heart. Quite on the contrary. But I tell you, they do these things because they are losing heart. They do these things because they don't want to give up. But instead of trusting in what the Bible says about ministry, they go to alternatives. And here Paul says, what they do is, they hide because of shame. They hide things because of shame. This is a difficult expression to translate. But it's uh, uh, Paul saying, these ministers, these who are called to preach the gospel plainly and simply, they're losing heart, so they don't want to touch in difficult matters, difficult problems of theology and application. So they hide things out of shame. And Paul says, we renounce that. We don't do it because we are not losing heart. We are going to preach the whole counsel of God. And I hope you have learned how beautiful and effective it is for your ministry to preach in series of books. Because you will see how the Holy Spirit takes these series and he will give you a specific Lord's Day when a specific problem in the congregation happened and that text will deal, deal with that exact problem. You couldn't be that well prepared yourself. But the Holy Spirit is. Renounce, brethren, the things hidden because of shame. Preach the whole counsel of God. What, is, uh, what are some other things that they do? They walk in craftiness and ad adulterate the word of God. There are a billion examples here of this happening again, not only in other denominations, but inside Presbyterian world. And I'll give you just one. You may feel tempted to dress up as a hipster. Wear hipster clothes. 21, 21st century, 20, almost 2020. Come on, Dr. Dyer. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem in itself, walking around as a hipster. But please do not preach as one. If you are convinced that you need to get rid of your pulpit, the pulpit from your church, and preach from a stool while drinking Starbucks coffee, and that's what will bring people to church and keep them there, you are mistaken. You may say, but pastor, I can be a hipster, preach from a stool, drinking Starbucks coffee, and preach the truth. I tell you, if you do that, you will probably try to hide some things that your people need to hear. 
you will probably not do what Paul says next. He rejects all craftiness, all gimmicks, all adulteration. And what does he do? He manifests the truth, commanding themselves or himself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I hope homiletics and preaching in Greenville Seminary is still being taught faithfully. If there's something that we learn here, is how to reach the conscience of our hearers. We're not the Holy Spirit. Quite on the contrary, we don't think that we only need to expound the text and not do any application because we're not the Holy Spirit. We do application. We must apply. We must reach the conscience of our people the best we can as human beings. And I'll give you an example of that right now. I've heard that an email was sent because attendance in chapel was not very good. Well, attendance today is good. There's a Brazilian preacher, international speaker. Why would seminary need to send an email to future ministers about attendance in chapel, maybe prayer meetings as well. Some would say, preach it, Pastor Broto. They need to hear it. But it's ironic because maybe who needs to hear is not here. They're not attending chapel right now. It's as ironic as when you talk in the evening worship service about people not coming, and they're not there. You have to preach that in the morning. <laughs> you have to tell them to come in the evening and even repent of that, as you have to repent of not being here in chapel. But then we go a little deeper in conscience. Those of you who are always here, always in prayer meetings, I ask you, why are you here? Are you here because it's mandatory? Are you here because it's an obligation to be here? Or do you love to be here in chapel, hearing Christ speak? That's how we commend ourselves to the conscience of every man manifesting the truth. You will do this in your churches. And I can guarantee you that people will come to you and say, who do you think you are? to preach these things here, even from elders. I guarantee it to you. Do not lose heart. Do not use gimmicks. Do not use craftiness or adulterate the word. But even if you do these things, that's the minimum you can do. Because in verses 3 and 4, Paul here reminds us that even though the gospel is simple, there is a simplicity in it, in its truth, reaching the conscience of every man, there is a veiling of the gospel. There is a blinding of the gospel. Let's read again verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I tell you, brethren, if the gospel is veiled, the problem is not the gospel. Calvin commenting on this, he says, If a blind man cannot see the sun, certainly the problem is not the sun. The gospel is simple. The gospel is clear. And in Greenville, we learn how to preach it. And how come people don't, don't come running to our churches? We are such good and faithful preachers because the God of this world keeps doing His work. You know it's done under the sovereignty of God. 
You know, he only has authority because God has given him. You know, he only does what is according to God's purposes. So the problem is in the God of this age. But this should not be an excuse for our small churches. I'm so faithful in preaching and manifesting the truth. We only have 25 people for 20 years. If that really makes your heart glad, I think there's a problem. I think there's a problem. Because we are true Calvinists, aren't we? And we know that while the blindness remains, the light will not shine in the heart. So here, when you preach to the consciences of man, you will preach to your conscience. And I must confess, I have preached this sermon before, and I had to prepare again for this time, and I was again convicted. Because if we are aware that preaching doesn't depend on how, only on how good we are, how prepared we are homiletically, but it depends also on the battle we do against the devil in prayer. And I confess to you, brethren, I don't pray as much as I prepare for the sermons in commentaries, in exegesis, in homiletical techniques. I don't pray as much as I should. I know you don't either. And I would love to protect my professors here. But I guess they would also be able to confess that we don't come to the Lord saying, Lord, as we preach, please, Take the blindness away. Take the blindness away so we can see Greenville won by the gospel, not by gimmicks. So maybe you think you are a true Calvinist today and you're not even a Christian yet. You're not even born again yet. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important for you to be in chapel. Because maybe 10 years from now, you can give this testimony. I went to seminary and I wasn't converted. And I was born again there and now I preach so others can be saved by the gospel only. That's why we keep on preaching. That's why we look at Verses 5 and 6, and this is our final motivation. Not only the simplicity of the gospel, in spite of the veiling of the gospel, we have the light of the gospel. We have the light of the gospel in verses 5 and 6. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Do you have this confidence in preaching? Paul is so clear. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. I don't have to teach you how to be Christocentric in your preaching. But you know how many reformed pulpits preach the text so well and hide Christ? You know that. And you have no excuse, especially from the Old Testament. Because even though Dr. Shaw is leaving, you have Dr. Morales, don't you? Don't you love his classes? I've never sat in one, only heard of them. Don't you love his classes? How from the Pentateuch, throughout the prophets, biblical theology shows us Christ, Christ, the gospel, everything there already. How can we preach in the Old Testament and hide Christ? 
but we preach Christ, Paul says here, and ourselves as your bond servants. Please learn this. Please learn this. You are going to be great preachers. You're not yet. Just to humble you. You're going to be great preachers. And you're going to feel tempted to be only preachers above everybody else. And let me tell you this. When your flock sees you coming out of that pulpit and being able to wash their feet, being their bond servants, your preaching will touch their hearts no matter what. The opposite will not help your ministry. The opposite will not help your ministry. Paul here then keeps on giving us confidence in preaching. And he makes a beautiful connection between the gospel and creation as he says in verse 6, For God who said light shall shine out of darkness. This is why we keep preaching. This is how we understand that the, the same God who created everything out of nothing will keep changing hearts. We'll keep changing hearts through the gospel alone. Let me open a parenthesis here and talk a little bit about the doctrine of creation that this seminary holds so dearly. If you can't see that what you understand from the gospel is connected to creation, you have a serious problem. And my children were able to attend a co-op here in South Carolina during this year. And I talked to a teacher there. He is a pastor, not very reformed, somewhat reformed, and not Presbyterian. And we were talking about literal six-day creation. And you know what he told me? He said that he follows the same attitude and behavior of the PCA. Who, which officially, officially has four views on creation that in theory are according to scripture. I'm just saying PCA because that's what he said. This can be found anywhere. You are better theologians than I am. But as a simple theologian, I, I think four views on literal six days creation doesn't sound very biblical. I'll leave you at that, pleading that you believe Scripture and our confessions about the God who created in six literal days and keeps now saving people from darkness. This is the end of the text. How Paul says, The one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Do not lose heart. That's what happened to you. That's what's happening all over the world. The God who is creator is also Savior. And He is still regenerating all of those that belong to Him. You have Christ and salvation, right? Is that the name? I understand some courses change their names. Not to be seeker sensitive, right? Just to be creative. Creative is good. We need to be creative. But I took the same course, Christ and salvation, so many years ago with Dr. Piper. And we were like, why are we talking about regeneration? The confession doesn't talk about it. There's no chapter in the confession about regeneration. We have, yes, there is. Chapter 10, effectual calling. And you're not supposed to be saying in your house, what comes first, effectual calling or regeneration? If I discover this, I will write a PhD on it and people will respect me. No, you look at the Bible and even though you don't know what comes first, effectual calling or the change of heart, 
That's what the Holy Spirit does to us and through our preaching. And that's what will make you not lose heart. Is Paul Christocentric? Oh, yes, he is. All over this teaching about preaching, he's about Christ, Christ, Christ. And in the end, he says that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And this is what's happening here right now. And if you haven't seen the glory of Christ, the problem is not the gospel. The problem is not the glory of Christ. It may be on the preacher, but it might as well be in the hearer. Again, some of you have to be told to be in chapel. How can you expect people to flock, to come to your preaching if you are not under preaching? Because that's not only your salvation, but it's your ongoing Christian life. Light doesn't shine only in justification. It keeps on shining in sanctification. And the face of Christ is always there. As we preach, we are always face to face with God in the face of Christ. Salesmen have quotas. And sometimes they will do anything to reach those quotas, especially during this time, looking for a bonus. You know what our quota is as ministers? Please open your Bibles to Jeremiah. Let's go to the Old Covenant. Old Covenant. The Old Covenant has so many lessons for us about the gospel and ministry. Jeremiah 23, 28 to 32. This is your quota, brothers. And those who are not ministers or future ministers here, I hope that's what feeds your soul. I hope that when one day you, if you see, if you see your minister trying to be hipster, <laughs> warn him. That's not what sheep needs. Need. Jeremiah 23. Verses 28 to 32. He says, The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord? And like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, the Lord declares. Behold, I'm against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and relate them, related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or commend them, nor do they furnish these people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. Do not be salesmen of the gospel. Be preachers of the gospel. Let us, Jesus Christ, let us pray to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord, we thank you because in spite of our weaknesses, your Holy Spirit makes your face shine upon us when we are under preaching, the preaching of the word. Again, I pray that you may bless these professors, this seminary, all the preachers that came out of here, and the ones who will come out, that we may be faithful in manifesting the truth and commending ourselves to the consciences of all men. Oh, bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.